Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to how to create a real app that runs in the cloud. My name is Ian Barker, and I'm the Embarcadero Developer Advocate. You can email me whenever you want at ian.barker.embarcadero.com. I answer every email. I really do. Well, so far we've had a pretty packed schedule. Um, we've covered Android apps, iOS apps, um, Christmas came along, and we also created a Windows app. We then created the similar app using the Mac, and we even had a webinar about Codelex, which is a really fascinating um, UI tool that creates the back-end business logic, all the complicated stuff that nobody wants to do and has to be done, but it's, it's a little bit of boring legwork. And um, last time we did two webinars as well, which was one to um, how to create a real Linux app. Um, we actually saw it running on Ubuntu, I think is how I showed it. And then on the Friday, we had a really great webinar with Andy from Der Secure and showing us the um, static analysis product that allows to allows you to look at your app and examine your code and find out if it's a vulnerable to hackers. It did. Um, he covered quite a lot of things like static code analysis, dynamic analysis, supply chain security. Um, very very interesting stuff. And we'll be looking at that again another time. And today we are covering how to create a real app that runs in the cloud. Next time we'll be looking at how to create an app for the Raspberry Pi. But we're not finished there. We've got a whole pack schedule for all of February and March, covering all sorts of features. And also Delphi's birthday on February the 14th. We're actually going to have the webinar the day before um, because I want to keep it on Tuesdays. And uh, it just so happens that this year, February 14th, uh, in the year that we're recording, is, uh, is a Wednesday. So uh, we've got other things to do that day as well. But uh, um, we're going to do a retrospective, <clears throat> pardon me, a... Um, a retrospective, a, a view back of the history of Delphi and also Turbo Pascal because Turbo Pascal um, recently turned 40 years old as well. So there's a lot to talk about. Well, what do we mean when we say the cloud? What, what, what exactly is that? Well, uh, the cloud in this context means the internet. It's, it's nothing more complicated than that. Sometimes people think it's some kind of literal cloud. Some people think it's a um, series of different weird machines and things like that. And really, um, basically, what most people say is, uh, the popular way is uh, of looking at it is it's running your program on someone else's computer. And it really is as simple as that. Uh, you're basically uh, running your computer either on your own server that is connected to the internet, um, uh, I wouldn't probably recommend running it on your own PC, but it could be your own PC, or more likely it's someone like Amazon or um, Azure or uh, somebody like that, and you're running your program on their servers, their computers. With Rad Studio, we've actually got a lot of different options built in, and just as many that are third party. Creating apps for the cloud and for the internet is probably one of the most popular things that you can do with Delphi and uh, Rad Studio in general. It's, it's actually relatively easy to do. The difficulty is working out which set of components you want. Not, uh, not uh, are there components to do it, but really which ones should I use to achieve that objective. And so one of the options is the one that I've got highlighted there, and that's Web Broker. Web Broker is included with Rad Studio. It creates non-visual server-side applications. So they don't run on someone's PC, they run on the server, and they then output or emit or uh, however you want to s s sort of say that, sends HTML, so web pages and XML um, packages, and uh, it uses events to construct that. So uh, when something happens, like someone wants to view a particular page or particular resource on the internet, uh, an event is triggered and then you can um, use a type of template substitution to create the HTML content. It's very, very powerful. It is a slightly older way of doing things. It's been around for quite a long time. As you can see highlighted there, there's all sorts of different types of dispatchers, as they're called, and uh, producers that allow you to create all sorts of content. You can um, have it linked to a data set and basically surface a data set out to the internet. And um, you can even include um, some other things to, to you know, like uh, 
uh, dynamic web pages. I also noticed, as you can see in there in the internet tab, there's a thing that says T Edge Browser and T Web Browser. These are not the same thing. Um, those are actually client side, and they basically allow you to create your own web browser and include web browser or web pages in your own application. So they're not really for the cloud as such. They're more for client side um, displaying something just as if you are a web browser. And in fact, using Ed Edge Browser or the T Web Browser, you could actually create your own uh, web browsers, and some people do. Um, you can have your own custom web browser that only allows people to go to certain options, for example, or something like that. And I think, um, I could be wrong, but Edge Browser, I think, is used in Rand Studio in the welcome pages. But uh, um, don't quote me on that. I don't really pay a lot of attention to some of those things. <laughs> I shouldn't do really, should I? Um, Built-in options for Windows and Linux using um, Page Producer and um, Web Broker. You can create a standalone console application. Basically, this is a bit like a, a command line DOS app or terminal app or however you want to um, think of it. Um, when that runs, that runs and keeps on running. And that then will respond to requests from client um, apps and uh, client pages. And... Um, will basically keep running in the background and until you terminate it apache dynamic link module this runs inside an apache web server and this allows you to create any kind of content you want and get it served up by the very popular apache web uh, server it it's um it's actually a very powerful way of doing things. There are some slight complications to do with what you do with Apache because there are lots of rules um, to do with Apache. And Apache is still probably that is probably the most popular um, web server out there, web server software. So you'll run Apache on a server somewhere and then your dynamic link module is picked up by Apache. There's a whole set of documentation from uh, the Apache project that tells you how to do this and you can generate content on the fly. It's it's quite popular. It's used for things like um, special authentication and uh, special um, you know delivery of content and stuff like that. A lot of people use it for that and swear by it and think it's great. Uh, other people say, no, it's not, not for them and they, they do it in different ways as well. The other thing you can do, and again, the, these all work for Windows and Linux, and that is create a CGI standalone executable. What do we mean by that? Well, um, your web page, and it could be Apache, it could be Nginx, it could be any type of other web server, um, will know how to run CGI executables. And what a CGI executable does, it's a bit like a standalone app, except it runs once and then terminates. Generally speaking, um, it's creating some specific uh, content as a one-off shot. Um, it could be that it, it's got a single job, like maybe to convert a, a, an image or maybe to return a set of images from a database based on um, some command line parameters that are sent to the uh, standalone executable. So standalone console application runs and keeps running, and the CGI standalone executable runs once and then terminates. Um, Apache, Ingenix, and all the other web servers understand how to run CGI, and uh, it's 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 very very easy to do. It's not uh, not at all complicated to create. Other options which are only for Windows, and that is a standalone Windows application. That's exactly what it says it is. It is a application that runs just like any other Windows application, except it serves up web content. And that web content again could be um, HTML or XML. Uh, depends on your use case. Um, we're not actually going to cover. Um, these kind of use cases right now but just so that you know that you can do it with web broker the other thing which is actually very popular and it's in the Microsoft world which is why it's Windows only is ISAPI dynamic link library this is a special DLL type which is usually used with Microsoft's IIS or Internet Information Server which I think is what the acronym stands for um, it, again, very popular. ISAPI has a few complications. When I've written things in the past, you can get some problems to do with restarting ISAPI DLLs and things like that. It creates a lot of um, state, shall we say. It understands that uh, it stores how it's running and things like that. It's just something, you know, once you get into it, you'll, you'll, you'll discover the issues. Google the answers and you'll go, oh, okay, that's what it is. It's an ISAPI problem, not, not actually a Rad Studio problem. But it is very popular. It is one of the options you can use for creating uh, an app. 
it's usually used just like all the others, like the standalone application and the CGI application. Um, it is used to serve content up just like the Apache module does, except it works for Microsoft's IIS. Um, Microsoft probably are third, I think, second or third in the world in terms of um, providing web servers. But in the corporate environment, in business environments, IIS probably rules the roost for um, a significant proportion of people. So it's uh, it's um, definitely something you shouldn't ignore. But you should know that those options are available and uh, there's some wizards that will help you create those. Other built-in options. These are a little bit more work. Um, in the sense that you have to do some of the uh, creating and putting together of things yourself. And probably the biggest one that's out there is a thing called Indie. Indie is extremely popular. I mean, fabulously popular. A lot of people um, either have these options themselves um, and use them, or they've created um, products on top of the Indie servers, on top of the Indie components. The types of servers that you've got available um, are actually quite specific so for example you can see there there's a um, UDP server and uh, you drop that on your app uh, create a few events uh, apply a few properties and drive a few um, properties uh, you know in your code and you can communicate using UDP which is a very popular method of communicating across the internet um, it also supports things like FTP servers um, finger server. A finger server goes back to a command called finger on, on Unix years and years ago. Same with Echo and uh, all these other things. Some of these um, servers you're never going to use. Um, very few people use finger nowadays. But back in the day when I used to be a Unix guy, finger was one of the ways of knowing it, um, you know, what, what a server supported and that's what it is. So you can see there's all sorts of kind of specialized ones. TCP server and UDP server are probably ones you're going to use the most. most. HTTP server and HTT proxy server also are very popular. And uh, an FTP server. FTP allows you to load files up and down to a server. And again, very popular. There are lots of um, programs out there like FileZilla, which is an FTP client, and many others as well, Transfer and a few others. Um, Indie includes things like mail handlers and um, Mappy and uh, uh, Pop3 and just about anything you could ever want. It is very widely used. There are some areas which can be a little bit complicated and it can be a little bit tricky to get right. The one of those is SSL, which you need to secure things like web pages so that they are serving up um, HTTPS and have that little padlock. Um, or just to encrypt your communications for email, you'll find that some services like um, Microsoft Exchange um, and Outlook Communications and even Google will require SSL um, or actually uh, T TLS is a type of uh, similar encryption. Um, Google, for example, to uh, use G Suite, if you're a corporate user, you'll find that there are very specific settings for um G Suite in terms of the t the type of uh, encryption. So TLS is one of them, and uh, it wants something like level 1.2, I think, or something like that. But uh, uh, again, this is probably more in-depth than we need to go into right now, but just so that you know, Indie is the thing. And sooner or later, if you use Rad Studio long enough, you're going to bump into something that either uses Indie or you're going to want to use it yourself. Um, most people will kind of see it as a must-have option. There are alternatives. Um, out there and um, ICS is one of them for example and ECGC also do some options and things like that as well but uh, Indie is built into the system and when you open a palette you can go down there and it's Indie servers and also what I haven't shown here is there's an Indie clients tab as well and the Indie clients tab allow you allows you to do things like create a mail client so not only send email but receive email um, calendar can um, you know, D, uh, iCal type uh, options as well. Um, just just name it, and there's some kind of client or server, and Indie's probably got an answer for it. Extremely popular and very well um, written system. Uh, other built in options DataSnap. DataSnap used to be known as Midas. And what this is used for primarily is for middle tier database uses. 
Um, the data snap is um, it, it's a very easy way of getting your um, data out onto the internet or across some network so that um, people connect to your data snap server and then your data snap server connects to your um, database server um, it's got some very interesting features one of the main features is that um, client apps are being able to invoke or call server functions uh, and for the server to automatically notify the client apps of changes and feedback um, it does this in a very clever way and um, you create a number of functions in the data snap app um, or Midas app as it used to be and, uh, and and then call those remotely again it's not something I'm going to show today but if you are interested in that kind of thing then data snap is included and uh, it's, it's very well respected go to the data snap server or data snap um, client options the um, rad studio help and samples also has some data snap uh, client server examples there as well other built-in options rad server uh, rad server is a very interesting product in that it is enterprise level middleware and endpoint server now it was originally created as an application server if you are familiar with um, tomcat which is used for java apps and things like that then rad server was originally um, written to kind of um, not combat that but also be along those lines it's kind of evolved over the years um, into more like a, a middleware server in the sense that it it can work via rest and json json is the um, javascript object notation it allows you to um, encapsulate or encode or um, represent shall we say objects using effectively plain text Basically, the whole of the internet works on JSON. Uh, if you don't know how JSON works, and you can see it's spelled out there, G A A J S O N, not J S O N, yeah, JSON. Um, you should probably read up on it. It's actually not difficult, and if you've used most other markup languages like rich text or something like that in the past, then JSON will make sense. XML is very similar. Um, JSON, once you start dealing with the internet, you need to understand how JSON works because the, it's just everywhere. Um, REST is the same. <coughs> RESTful services are ways of being able to call things on the internet, uh, either with the URL or URI, should we say, and um, do what are known as CRUD uh, operations on data for example so create read update and delete is what crud stands for and rest allows you to do that in a fairly easy way in a stateful and in non-stateful way it can also um, support rad server also supports things like user authentication which is one of your biggest headaches um, because once you put something on the internet then you've got to start looking at security and making sure that things are not going to go uh, kapow <laughs> um, as people hack them and you will face hackers I've seen it repeatedly it supports things like push notifications which are actually quite handy um, alerts shall we say down to the clients geolocation and data storage it uh, integrates closely with the built-in FireDAC database components if you've not come across FireDAC yet we are going to do a session on databases and in fact a couple of sessions and we're going to look at what FireDAC does. FireDAC is the RAD Studio um, database access layer, shall we say, or group of components, and allows you to communicate with most types of databases out there. Everything from um, MySQL to SQL Server to um, Oracle, you name it. It's, it's very powerful. Um, you can use FireDAC just like the old-fashioned components if you're an uh, old Delphi 7 user or something like that uh, but it's also got some um, very interesting capabilities where it can do things like update records automatically and return arrays of, of data and some, some very interesting stuff um, but we'll cover that in another session so RAD server integrates with that uh, very um, closely uh, it is designed to be optimal that way um, RAD server does have some charges associated with it so deploying RAD server, it depends on whether you've got enterprise or architect, and you must have enterprise or greater. Um, depending on whether you've got enterprise or architect, then there may be some charges for um, licensing or using it. 
um, and deploying it out there. I think for um, enterprise, you get one license or something like that. And um, architect, I think it's unlimited. But uh, again, look at the product matrix because I, I always forget this when I'm recording these things live. And uh, I should take notes ready. But uh, yeah, hey, a little bit of homework there for you to look these things up. Where will you find the built in options? Well, if you go File New, and um, up will come this dialog that you see here. And then you can see some of the options that are available. So if I was going to create a new data snap module, which has got a server module um, that does all the handling of uh, um, the requests and serving up the content, uh, click on data snap and then server module and off we go. It creates a, a server module for them. Um, if I want to create an entire data snap REST application, again, we just talked about Red Server um, supporting REST as well then you can create a data snap server with support for REST um, directly from there. These are 99% done in the sense that um, if you create these particular options, most of the work is done for you and you just need to put in what content you're going to serve up and link it up to a few databases or, uh, or you know, methods and functions of your own. Uh, you can see there's all sorts of options and if you look very closely in that dialog and I've tried to make it as big as possible you'll see that it marks which ones it supports so for example for the server module that particular one only works on uh, Windows but the rest application works on Windows and Linux the more interestingly and this is probably where one of the strengths of data snap is is that the client module can be almost anything so it will work on Windows, it will work on Linux, it will work on Android, and it uh, works on mobile and desktop. That's what it's trying to say there. Um, very, very useful. But you can find all of the other options there. And in fact, you can see I've got some third-party solutions in there as well, like TMS um, and uh, a few others. But uh, that's where you find them on File, New, Other. Okay, some other options that are included or available with Rad Studio includes the Apercept AWS SDK. Um, this is a really interesting SDK. Now, uh, if you're used to um, add-ons and um, packs and of components, adding a lot of little components in your your uh, your component palette there, um, AWS SDK from Apercept is not quite like that. There are a couple of components. And uh, I think there's some more planned in, in the future. But this is an API that you use by um, including in your uses clause. And when you do that, um, this gives you the opportunity to access many, many features on uh, AWS. Amazon's uh, AWS, which uh, I mean, AWS WS stands for Amazon Web Services. Um, very, very comprehensive. All sorts of um, features on there that, that are very useful to people for running things in the cloud and actually interacting with things in the cloud. Um, if you've seen my space computer demo where I have a, a, a kind of Star Trek-y type um, computer, I was able to add the ability for the space computer to talk. Um, I didn't uh, hire Art Margiel Barrett who used to do the voice, um, partly because she passed away a few years ago. But uh, what I did was I used Amazon Polly, which is one of their services, to get the uh, computer to talk. And it was easy. It was literally, you know, I think four or five lines of code. And then after that, I could just literally say, say something. And the um, Amazon uh, cloud service would uh, make my app do some speaking. So uh, very, very easy to do. And uh, Richard Hatherall was the uh, CEO of uh, Apercept. He's got some very good examples. And I know he's got some new things planned as well. And we're actually going to do a specific session about the Apercept um, components, uh, uh, Apercept SDK because it is very very interesting what you can do. Um, Amazon is probably, I mean, almost easily the biggest um, cloud provider out there. They provide things like S3 buckets, which allow you to store your data. They um, include things that allow your programs to run um, triggered from things in the cloud. Obviously, there's the um, Amazon Alexa devices and a few other things as well that. Um, you know, are, are really probably the first useful digital assistants that came out. There was Siri and there was a few other things as well, but um, the Amazon version was, was uh, quite powerful because of the AWS um, interactivity. And that is something you can use 
uh, straight away with Apercept. It comes included, I think, with Enterprise and Architect. And uh, if you just go to their site and have a look, you, you, there's all sorts of examples. Like I say, we are going to do a webinar specifically um, showing the features of the Apercept AWS SDK because there's just a whole bunch of things going on that it does. Other third-party solutions, IntraWeb. IntraWeb is included with some versions of Rad Studio, and you can also purchase it from them directly at a-z.com. And it provides, uh, A to Z provide an Embarcadero version, um, which is version 14, I think, a slightly older version. This is completely free. Um, however, it's a little bit restricted in what it can do. What IntraWeb does is allows you to code your um, web apps as if you're writing a Delphi program. So you will go in um, to IntraWeb and create an IntraWeb app and you design your forms just as if you're designing a normal Delphi application and you can drop them controls on like combo boxes and lists, uh, boxes and buttons, all the things that you're used to and uh, then you can um, hit compile and it will create either a standalone app or a um, add-in DLL for things like um, Apache and uh, even a Windows service, which will serve up your web pages um, from IntraWeb automatically. There are no web pages, no HTML created as such. It's all self-contained within the IntraWeb app, which obviously makes it very secure. The big advantage as well with IntraWeb is that anything that your regular app can do, your Windows app, um, like access the hardware of the server it's running on, GPS location, um, you know, all the things that you can't normally do in a web page, you can do in interweb because the interweb server is running on the server, the actual physical um, computer server itself, and doing things there. Very, very interesting, and I actually used it um, myself several times for customer applications back in the day, and I'm going to show you a little bit of a demo later about how to, um, what, what interweb does. Um, it's It's got absolutely everything you could want. Um, first version 15 is the latest version and removes some of the restrictions like what port you can run it on and um, supports a few things like SSL and a few other things as well and plus uh, it supports Bootstrap. Bootstrap is a, a library from Google that allows you to do some very cool looking things um, with the web uh, style buttons and space things out and frames and things like that and it allows the controls to be styled using Bootstrap which is, is actually very useful. Another third-party solution, and probably one of my favourites, is TMS WebCore. Again, I've used TMS WebCore myself in some customer applications, and in fact in a very big client-server application. And uh, TMS WebCore is a, a fascinating product. It has some um, interesting capabilities. The way it works is it uses the PASTA.js library in the background to convert your Delphi code into JavaScript, into a Java single JavaScript app um, that you, you runs in your customer's browser, in their web browser, um, and creates pure HTML pages and CSS um, style pages, uh, style files, should we say, automatically from your Delphi code. So you lay out your Delphi forms using TMS WebCore components and probably something like their FNC components and uh, create your app just as you do normally in the Rudd Studio IDE. And when you hit compile, what comes out of it is actually a bunch of HTML, just regular web pages. And this will run on any web server. There's nothing you need specifically special. You can copy it up to any um, provider. So if you're using something like um, DigitalOcean or GoDaddy or something like that, you can uh, put those pages up using their web hosting. And when your customer goes to your, your website that you've created here, um, down will come a bunch of web pages, just as if you designed it in uh, Notepad++ or Notepad or some other um, tool in uh, writing HTML the hard way. Very, very interesting technology. Um, I like it a lot. It's one of my favorites. It's different from IntraWeb. IntraWeb is self-contained, and WebCore is um, giving you the HTML um, to use. Now, um, a good friend of mine and MVP, Dr. Holger Flick, has written quite a few books on this. I think five or six at the time that I'm recording this. And he's just had a recent one come out as well, which we're going to do a webinar about that as well, um, that shows you him creating a full application. 
um, using X data and uh, and uh, Aurelius in the background, which is another TMS technology. But uh, very interesting stuff, and um, you know it's worth looking into. Both Interweb and Webcore are uh, great products, great solutions. The other interesting thing about um, Webcore is that um, you know there is there are no restrictions. It can run on any web server, and I tested a lot of browsers, web browsers, uh, you know, iPads and um, Chromebooks and things like that. And because it's just regular web pages and uh, you know CSS scripts uh, and JavaScript, it'll just run on any web server and any, almost any target. I didn't actually find um, any any uh, device that it wouldn't run on. But they also take that a little bit stir further, so they allow you to actually create a thing called a PWA. A PWA is a progressive web app. So if you've ever been to a web page, um, I know in the United States, doctors do this quite a lot, and it says, uh, this web page is available as an app, would you like to install it on your iPhone or your Android phone? Uh, and you can hit yes. What it does is then downloads the website as a thing called a PWA. And uh, from then on, your PWA can do things like run offline when there isn't an internet connection. Um, you probably need to read more about this. Just look up PWA or Progressive Web App. But TMS Webcore supports the ability to take your Delphi written HTML page and create them as PWAs, which is something Interweb doesn't support. And uh, that means that you can then include offline functionality. PWAs also get a few other capabilities that it can do to access um, devices and sensors and things like that as well. It can also target Electron, which is my least favorite uh, framework, but it's very popular. Electron is basically a special wrapper that wraps web pages and JavaScript pages and uses a thing called Node.js. Um, which is a kind of operating system slash language. And uh, you can create Electron applications. If you've ever used anything like Spotify, uh, the cross-platform app is or used to be written in Electron, and you can install it on anything, Linux, Mac, Windows, it will run. It includes uh, automatic updating technologies and things like that as well. Um, so with TMS Webcore, you can target Electron if you want to. Um, I've done this before in the past literally um, created a web core app hit a button and boom out came a pwa app as well a progressive web app uh, hit another button and bang out came an electron app very very easy to do um, extremely simple couple of clicks and off we went um, in a challenge that i worked on a while ago it took me a couple of hours to create the uh, web core the original web core app which was like a proper html app and uh, and then minutes, literally two or three minutes to create a progressive web app version of that um, set of web pages. And then another couple of minutes to create a, an Electron application. There's nothing like this faster on the um, on sale anywhere, as far as I'm aware. It's, it's quite incredible. And uh, all power to TMS, our, one of our tech partners, for providing this. They also have an area, a very interesting technology called Miletus. Now, what Miletus does is it is a cross-platform wrapper, a bit like Electron. It's kind of a competitor for Electron. And uh, with Miletus, you can target absolutely anything, including the Raspberry Pi. Now, what you can do with this is you can create your, um, your app using Delphi, just writing regular Delphi code, and uh, use WebCore to create all the forms and put all the components on and add all the functionality then target Miletus, and Miletus then wraps that and provides you access to things that you cannot get in a normal web page as well. It will um, encapsulate it just like Electron does, so you can do things like open files on the file system, and it looks like a regular um, application as if you'd written it in normal Delphi. Very interesting, very, very useful um, functionality. Um, I quite like Miletus, and I'm going to show Miletus um, later on in our series when we talk about the Raspberry Pi. I'm going to target the Raspberry Pi in other ways as well in an upcoming webinar, but also I'm going to show how Miletus works because it's definitely worth looking into. And by the way, when you create Webcore um, apps, you don't actually have to create the HTML. It's done for you automatically as you design the forms in the normal RAD Studio IDE. But if you want to, 
you can get a web designer to design the HTML and then get your application to just link to that um, HTML page. So a proper um, web design designs the HTML and styles it and does all those things. And then you can get your code to actually interact with that um, that set of web pages. Very, very interesting technology. I, I like it. It works very well. Another third party solution is Unigui. Unigui um, is uh, interesting in that it also provides another alternative way of getting your apps out onto the cloud and also providing web solutions that are web pages. Uh, it can, tame, can turn your application into a web server, actually a web app. Um, web server is not quite an accurate description there. It can make the UI work over the internet. It does this using a thing called Censure, which is actually an idea of product and Censure JS and um, they've got uh, three different editions a personal edition a pro edition and then the complete edition the uh, personal edition has got I think a restriction on 30 concurrent users at once um, pro has got unlimited and complete has got everything uh, but the kitchen sink as you would expect otherwise why would they call it complete um, it works by providing a comprehensive set of components of its own um, a bit like TMS Webcore does as well and uh, it includes as you can see that little screenshot there um, you know toolbars and um, trees and graphs and various other things uh, I like it it's, it's interesting it's not one I've personally used but I have come across it the price for it is actually very reasonable as well um, it's, it's an approachable amount of money um, to to purchase uh, not included for free, but uh, I think they do have some trials as well that you can try out. That's Unigui. Okay, so now let's go to a demo and see what we can do to create a few uh, cloud-based apps and run in the cloud. Okay, so the first application I'm going to show you is going to be a TMS Web Core application, uh, just because it's fairly easy to do. Um, there are different options. Bootstrap is more fancy and pretty. Uh, web application is uh, your basic bog standard uh, web app. Um, because I'm going to do a demo, let's just show what the basics are like. So uh, it looks like Delphi. It looks like a um, standard project. Um, I'm going to create a folder called uh, test um, uh, with WC1, just because I can. Uh, we're going to call it that and we're going to call the project now you notice it's offering to save the um, HTML there test WC1 and the finally it's going to ask me to save the project test WC1 um, seems a little bit unnecessary but it's not because you're actually creating three different files like so now You'll notice down at the bottom here um, that there is a HTML tab. And that is actually something that you can give to a, a HTML um, web designer, you know, your regular web designer. And they can put some stuff in there and um, create it and make it look pretty. But uh, what we want to do is just start off by doing it the Delphi way. So we are going to choose a uh, panel. And because it's TMS web, we want a web panel. And just like we have before, we're going to align that at the top of the screen. Uh, we'll get rid of the caption. People say that's the most useless property, a uh, caption on the uh, panel. And we're going to uh, also choose, oops, uh, also choose on the palette. We're going to choose a calendar. Uh, put it in there and again uh, hit in F11 to go to the properties we're going to say align that to client now this is this is going to be particularly ugly but let's not worry about that and then finally we're going to choose a button and a web button um, now they support all sorts of other controls and different styling and things like this but this is a bit of a quick and dirty um, demo so we're going to say show the date and I think you can guess what this button's going to do that when someone uh, clicks on it, what it's going to do is it's going to um, show the date selected in the calendar. So that's web calendar one is the name of the control. 
here, Web Calendar 1, and all this is using is the standard Delphi um, language, show a message, format date and time, the day of the week, the month, the, the actual date, you know, the 7th, 18th, 23rd, or whatever, and the year. Okay, now, this is where the interesting bit happens. If we uh, hit F9, what happens is it goes away and compiles the app, and then it will, you can't see it because it's in a different window, it will run the app in my default browser because that's how I've got it set up. And you'll notice that the calendar works as you would expect. Um, and it's looking fairly nicely styled. Um, but I can add Bootstrap and I can, I've got full control over all these colors, even though it's a web app. And now I can say, show the date. And it says June the 5th, 2024, which is actually correct. Now, um, in the meantime, down in my little system tray, what you can't see is a little web server running. Okay, so how does it do that? And, and incidentally, if I hit F12 and um, bring my whoops, uh, bring my web browser where you can see it, whoops, like so, um, in here, I can see all the source code of what's being run. But what's even more interesting is that I can actually see the um, the Pascal source code of everything that's running, including my little um, uh, demo uh, app that I'm just writing just a second ago, test WC1. And even if I go down to it, I can see, let's see if I can drag this out of the way, uh, I can actually see the source code of my program in my browser. Now this is Microsoft Edge and there is the actual source code. And as you can see, there's the, the DFM and all the rest of it. But you can see my line of code. Very interesting. I can also have the um, the browser console come up, the web browser console. If I just get rid of that for a second, you can actually add breakpoints as well. So um, with this version of, um, of WebCore, I can actually set a breakpoint in the IDE and then when it hits the breakpoint, it will actually break from this browser and go out. Um, you can emit things to the web browser console and do lots of exciting things like that. Just like a regular web program, because that's effectively what it is. So, uh, very interesting. Now, if I just close this for a second and go back to the app, um, you can see all the, the regular um, Delphi code here. But what has happened, What what where is our actual um, program? Well, if I go to the project folder, TMS Web, in here is all of the regular HTML and JavaScript that's been created. And in fact, in this particular case, uh, I don't know if I can open it with anything. Uh, let's see if I can open it with Ultra Edit. You can see that's just regular um, HTML that's been created. And the thing that runs a bunch of scripts, there's ways of saying just I just want one script or it'll break all the scripts down separately and load them in. It's, it's very interesting, very powerful. All you deploy is just the regular HTML. There's nothing, nothing special. And off it goes and runs. And you can convert this into a progressive web app and so on and so forth. And there's lots of different controls, as we talked about before, um, uh, to go, go with the web core and they support all their FNC stuff. So that is a WebCore app. Now let's create a, another app. This time we're going to say uh, file new other, and we're going to go to interweb, and we're going to say uh, run the interweb application wizard. Okay. So I'm going to click this. We're going to have a standalone application, but it could be uh, an iOS, IIS, Microsoft IIS extension, or it could be an interweb library, which means it can run by other programs. But we're just going to choose standalone application. Could be using HTTP Sys, which is more a modern way of um, supporting HTML uh, apps. We're going to say test, um, oops, test, oh dear, test, um, iWeb um, 1, like that, and we are going to say OK. It just tells us what it's creating, and after a couple of seconds, we will get a app. 
um, double click on here and just a form just like you've seen before exactly the same uh, thing as you're used to we are going to go to um, down to intraweb I bet I missed it here it is and we're going to choose a region now intraweb's controls are slightly different to your regular controls so a region is basically their version of a panel um, and you've seen in the demos before I've chosen a panel but it is the same principle, aligning it to the top. And we're going to choose a button and put the button up there. And you can already see it looks a bit like a, a Delphi 7 app, if anything. Um, we're just going to change the um, caption on that button um, to say, show the date. Oops. Oh dear, show, Ian, show the date. There you go. Live coding. And the final thing we're going to choose is... Uh, calendar control. Okay. Calendar control. Uh, here we go. Interweb calendar. Um, now, the same thing as I've done previously. There are um, these apps don't support styling as such. Um, actually, the TMS Web Core does, and I, I forgot to show you that. You can actually say, uh, pick up the uh, browser style, and it will go black if that's what it's done. But there are um, various colors that I can pick, and I can change the font and all the rest of it. I'm going to start off with it um, showing the default colors. If I double click on the button, just as if it's a regular um, uh, Delphi app, and then I'm going to cheat by copy and pasting something over here so I don't have to type things. Uh, live and make a mess of it you'll notice that show message in other apps you've seen me just type in show message but actually um, with interweb it's a web application not application so by default um, in a, an irregular Delphi app it's the application object that does the show messaging but in uh, an intro web, web app there's a thing called a web application and that's doing the show message and it's apart from that format date time is exactly the same we're actually talking to our interweb calendar control and we're choosing the selected date and if you just go back into here and choose this you can see there's a selected date property if i um, click on save and then run it what will happen is i'm just going to say allow for that and then um, what i get is because i've said as a standalone you can get rid of this this is the default uh, controller this is almost like a web server so this allows me to debug um, I wouldn't deliver my actual interweb app like this but if I click on here it will actually run in my default browser now I know the fonts look ugly I'm, I'm doing interweb a disservice here by uh, having those ugly fonts but let's let's uh, pick the 18th okay and then click on show this at the day and you can see Thursday uh, the 18th. If I keep going and choose uh, August the 13th, for example, I've selected that and now when I say that it says OK. Now, um, the app is running like a regular app. The difference between this and WebCore is that you can't really see anything apart from the HTML because all of the control is in the background um, via the interweb uh, stuff. Now, what about if we've got uh, an what about if we've got uh, an app that we want to um, just going to get these out of the way to run that does something a little bit more powerful? What can you really do with these um, executables? Well, I'm going to run an example app here that um, is a live app that's actually used and by customers. So this is running um, uh, port 8094. I'm going to click to test this in. This is an interweb app. So this is running as a service. The reason it's black is because I've got dark mode turned on. So all this part is regular Delphi. And when I run it, it will open in the browser. You can see how fast it is. If I click on this and then say password, I can log in. And this will work on an iPhone or an iPad or something like that. Now, if I go into um, here, then I can call a function this is running some PHP in the background and choosing uh, by the way these names are all fake but it's choosing a, a report but let's say on the fire report well 
Amber means it hasn't heard anybody for ages. So let's do something cool. Let's go to the web clock. Clock in. And we'll just say uh, remote. And we've clocked in. OK. We go back to the menu. And now say who's in fire report. You can see Aaron Adams is there. So this is all controlled by um, IntraWeb. And this is an example of a genuine program that is live and out there being sold. Um, so IntraWeb is very, very powerful. There is a web call program that does very similar things. Uh, works slightly differently. I can't show you that because the information is uh, confidential. But uh, I've worked on a very, very big um, web call product that, that does even more than this and is extremely powerful. So um, these are the kind of things you can do to make your um, apps run in the cloud. I've only scratched the surface. Coming up in a future webinar, we are going to um, have an app that will do internet things and connect to some devices and things like that. In that demo, I'm going to actually show you some programs that are running on a cloud service, um, probably DigitalOcean, but it might be Amazon. And you will be connecting to those apps that are running in the cloud completely truly as apps that are running as um, uh, web services and um, and service servers out there on the uh, internet. Uh, and it will then be talking to devices. We're going to have a little receipt printer and a barcode reader and uh, a mobile app. Put everything together and have it running uh, separately. Cool stuff, huh?